So we have a special treat uh, in store for you today. You're going to be so happy you came. So our guest speaker this morning is Dr. Gloria Burgess. She's an inspirational speaker, a seminar leader, and executive coach. Um, she engages individuals and teams in finding the vital core of their creative genius. And she weaves that together with her own personal legacy using the threads of authenticity, creativity, soulfulness, and cultural inclusion. She has triumphed over extreme poverty, racism, and sexism, and she shows you that life circumstances do not have to predict your destiny. She is the author of Pass It On and Dare to Wear Your Soul on the Outside, as well as many other books, which we do have in the lobby following the service. And she has presented, she's been a, a presenter and a keynote to tens of thousands of people in nearly 30 different countries. And her clients have included Microsoft and Starbucks, Boeing, MSNBC, Equal Opportunity, Opportunity, Equal, excuse me, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, just to name a few. So join me in welcoming Dr. Gloria Burgess. Good morning. Good morning. It's really a treat to be back here with you this morning. And um, uh, thank you to Pastor Karen for inviting me once again. I did not expect to hear this magnificent solo. Uh, thank you. Very, very beautiful, Frederick. And uh, I was singing Ishe Olua as I came down this morning from Edmond, so thank you. <laughs> what a blessing, what a blessing. Today I want to talk with you about faithfulness. So I'm going to share a little bit of my story with you about my faithfulness to my calling in transformational leadership. And as I share with you this morning, I invite you to reflect on a couple of questions. The first question is, what is the rhythm of faithfulness in my own life? And the second question is, how might I become more faithful in my walk with family and friends and even total strangers? Now, I just finished writing a chapter for a book. And since this chapter is all over me, <laughs> still thinking about it, still in my heart, I'd like to share a little bit about that book and that chapter with you. But first, I'm going to give you a little bit of context. Last year, I submitted a paper for the Faulkner Conference in Oxford, Mississippi. Now, the purpose of that conference is to lift up the literary scholarship focused on William Faulkner's writing, his novels, his short stories, his screenplays, his poems. The director and curator of the conference is Dr. Jay Watson. Now, Jay was absolutely on fire. He was thrilled to read my paper, and he invited me to present it. But he said, just one caveat, Dr. Burgess, please, please don't turn this into an academic paper. <laughs> now, when Jay introduced me last July, he said that my paper was the most distinctive he'd read for that year's conference. And what I submitted is the story that I'm going to share with you a little bit later this morning. Now, I was a bit surprised and honored to be introduced by Dr. Watson in this way. You see, I was born in Oxford, Mississippi. I was born in Oxford back when Mississippi was a good place to be from. Okay, how many of you have ever been to Mississippi? Yeah, been to Oxford? You know the town square? 
Okay, anybody else been in the South in general? I'm talking about South of Tacoma, right? Okay, <laughs> so you know what I'm talking about. So when I was a little girl, I actually thought I lived in an all-black town. I didn't know the meaning of segregation. So every Saturday morning when my family went to the other town, which was really downtown Oxford, I had a different kind of experience. Now, even though I didn't know the meaning of segregation, let me tell you something, I felt its impact. When we walked around the town square, same town square, just like today, we had to go through the back door of the shops. And the shopkeepers would call my parents by their first names, even though we had to call them Mr. and Mrs. so-and-so, right? And you know that little feeling that you get in your gut, like <clears throat> when you know that something's wrong up in, up in here, right? Well, that's the feeling that I got as a little kid. Now I'm, you know, three, four, five years old, but I know that this is the way it's supposed to be. And my mother tells this story. She says, I remember you standing in the square and putting your hands on your hips and your head was doing one of these. And she said, you made a declaration. And what I said was, someday, someday when I grow up, I'm going to make it impossible for anybody to treat me or my parents or my sisters different because of the color of our skin. Now, little did I know that God was already constructing the scaffold of my legacy. So last summer at this conference, I began my presentation, as I always do, with gratitudes. I thanked the folks who had come to the conference. I gave a special thanks to all the folks who came to Oxford just to hear me. I mean, there was one whole row <laughs> of aunties and uncles and cousins, there was another whole row <laughs> of my immediate family, right? Friends, relatives who had flown in or driven in from New York or Georgia or Michigan, from all over. Now, most of these folks came for one night only, just to hear me speak. And they were gonna be on a plane or back in their car driving home at dawn 30 the next morning. The folks present included my mother, Mildred Blackman McEwen. She just turned 87 years old. So I thanked my family, my extended family, my family friends for showing up, for representing. You see, all of these people are part of my community. They are part of what I call the mud and the straw, the mud and the straw of my personal village. I would not be here with you today without their broad shoulders, their fierce, stout shoulders to stand on. I also thank Dr. Watson for honoring me and my family, for inviting me to share my story with his esteemed colleagues from all over the country and some people from international as well. Now, you might be wondering, why so much gratitude? Well, that's who I am. <laughs> and I was simply being faithful to who I am and to whose I am. I was also keenly aware that this was an important and a historic occasion for my family and for Dr. Watson. Now, as the curator of that 45-year-old conference, Jay also wore another hat. And it's a hat that everybody in this sanctuary wears as well, whether we're conscious of it or not. And that hat, that role, is gatekeeper. Now, I thanked Jay for being a gracious gatekeeper, because in Oxford, especially at the University of Mississippi at Ole Miss, the gate has not always swung both ways, especially not for African Americans. Now, that was true when I was a little girl growing up in the segregated South, and unfortunately, it's still true today. 
It's true in Oxford. It's true in many of the countries that I've had the blessing to travel to. And you know it's true right here in our own beloved city of Seattle. But you know what? God is so faithful. God is faithful. He's still revealing to me why my father and Mr. Faulkner met one another. And he's still revealing to me why he chose me to be the one in my family to be the steward of this particular story. Last year's conference theme was Faulkner and money. <laughs> Faulkner and money. And I called my presentation Legacy, the currency, the currency of eternity. Everything I know about legacy, I learned from my mother, my father, from Faulkner, and from God. Here's what I know. Our current notions of legacy are outmoded. They're too barren. They're too constrained to hold the magnificence of the human spirit. Contrary to conventional Western ways of knowing, legacy is not something that happens out there. It's not something that happens at the end of our lives. It's not something that we construct. It's not something that we gather up in terms of financial assets and then bequeath those assets to others. Legacy is so much more. I believe legacy's focus is spiritual. And the focus of legacy is about the inner music, the inner geography of who we are, what we say, and what we do. Is all of that in harmony? Are we faithful? Are we faithful? Are we faithful? Ultimately, legacy is a summons, a call to stewardship, a call to be faithful servants, a call to make a covenant with the future. Not tomorrow, but today and every day. 365, 24, 7. For us here today, as sisters, as brothers, as daughters and sons, we make that same covenant here at Unity, in our neighborhoods, in our communities, at work. Each of us creates a legacy, whether we are conscious of it or not. And I believe the greatest gift that we can give God is to be intentional, intentional, about the legacy we live, because it's all about the choices we make moment to moment, day by day. What you choose is all about your faithfulness to who you are and to whose you are. At the end of the day, legacy is about every decision you make, every phone call you take, every text message you send, who you decide to invite, to include at your table, or who you decide to exclude and keep away. Legacy is an invitation to be faithful to your values, to be faithful to who you are on the inside. Let me tell you a little bit about faithfulness and about the intertwined legacies of my father and Mr. Faulkner. Now, some of you may be kind of scratching your head, who is this William Faulkner? Who is this person? Right? Now, I know some of you know, right? But some of you may not know. He was probably the most celebrated American author of the 20th century. Nobel Prize winning, Pulitzer Prize winning. And he kind of had a bad rap. Reclusive not very friendly, not very outgoing, very focused on his work, on his genius. Well, let me tell you a, 
a story about the Faulkner that I know. Like me, my father was born in Oxford, Mississippi. He was born 87 years ago. Now back then, Oxford was very, very different than it is today. And when my father was a little boy, four or five years old, he had two dreams. Talk about climb every mountain. <laughs> One of his dreams was to live in a house with running water. His other dream was to go to college. Now, back in those days, this was the Jim Crow South. So dreams like that could get you killed. But that didn't faze my father. He would talk to anybody about his dream. Didn't matter what you looked like, didn't matter where he was. You could be black, you could be brown, you could be white, you could be yellow or red. Yeah, that's what we call people in the black community, yellows and reds, okay? Didn't matter. My father was in your face talking to you about his dreams. Well, now he's a young man, and he's 21 years old. He's married. He has three little girls, including me, like you heard Lynn Marie read about. And he's working at Ole Miss. He can work there, but he can't go to school there because it's still segregated. But unbeknownst to him, he's one step closer to his dreams. So he's talking to the professors, to the students, again, to anybody who would listen. And you know that little game of telephone where you tell somebody, and they tell somebody else, and they tell somebody, and they tell somebody? Well, one of those somebodies was a fellow by the name of Dr. Leston L. Love. And he was one of the deans at Ole Miss. And he wanted to meet my father. And when he met him and heard about his dreams and saw his determination and passion and faith in himself, he said, Mr. McEwen, I think I know somebody who can help you with your dream. Did you hear what I said? He said, Mr. McEwen. Now, you weren't called Mr. Anything as a black man in those days. Dr. Love gave my dad a slip of paper with a name written on it. And the next day, he walked up to Roanoke to see Mr. Faulkner. And when Faulkner saw him, he said, come, tell me. Tell me all about your dreams. Where do you want to go to school? Alcorn, a &M College. Oh, that's a mighty fine school for blacks. Faulkner fell in love with my father as well. And he said, young man, Mr. McEwen, I would like to help you. I want to pay for your tuition. I want to pay for your room and board. I want to pay for your books. I'm going to get you and Millie a job so you won't have to worry about pocket change. And we'll send clothes for your kids so you won't have to worry about buying clothes. Well, what do you think my father said? He said, no, <laughs> sir. Now, I'm one years old. <laughs> I'm a little babe in arms, and I'm going, what are you thinking? <laughs> this is your lifelong dream. He said, no, sir, I don't see how I could ever pay you back. And Faulkner just looked at my father, and he said, oh, Mr. McEwen, I don't expect you to pay me back. You just pass this blessing on when you're able to do that. And that's how my dad lived his life. That fall, we went to Alcorn A&M with me and my two older sisters and my mother by his side. Now, when he graduated, he did pass it on. And you know what? He would have done that anyway because that was part of his DNA. He was being faithful to who he was. If you didn't have your GED, if my dad was still alive, he'd be sitting right out here going, hey, get your GED. If you didn't have your community college degree, he'd say, hey, get your community college degree. If you didn't have your undergrad or graduate or professional degree, boom chakalaka, he'd be right there in your face, all over you, 
encouraging you to get your education. Because he knew the value of education. And for him, it was his ticket to ride. To ride the train to freedom from poverty, freedom from being pushed down, stomped down, muted, erased. I mean, that was my father, passionate, tireless, unshakable in his faithfulness to who he was. Now, I consider it a real blessing to be a witness and to amplify and to be able to share that part of my story and that part of my father's and my family's story. For this is the legacy created by my father's dream, by his vision, and by his and Faulkner's faithfulness to who they were as human beings. Their uncommon respect for the birthright dignity of every human being has created a legacy that continues to resound within our family and throughout the world. I've had the opportunity to share this story on every continent but Antarctica. <laughs> and if the penguins would host me, I'd probably be there too, <laughs> sharing this story, right? So we're creating a ripple effect that keeps on flowing and flowing and flowing. Let me tell you something, when we are faithful to ourselves, it helps us to be faithful to other people. It becomes easier for us to put a face on a hungry child. It becomes easier for us to put a face on a homeless woman. Easier for us to put a face on those folks, that young man, that young woman who may not have hair like ours or cheeks like ours or lips like ours. When faithfulness becomes our standard, our standard MO, our way of being and moving through the world, we don't have to worry about how to start that conversation. You know, that difficult conversation, the one that we think we're not equipped to start? No. It becomes easier to start that conversation, to build a bridge. It becomes easier to build community why? Because we are in community when we're faithful to ourselves, when we're faithful to other people. And it's okay to say, you know, I really want to ask you something, but I'm not quite sure how to do that. You know what? That's how you do that. <laughs> it's that simple. I host conversations around peacemaking and bridge building across these huge divides, these huge chasms that we have constructed as human beings. When we see the birthright dignity of everyone and we put a face, a familiar face on the stranger, that's what it's all about. We too, can create that ripple effect. And we never know where that ripple will expand. And you know what? I don't think it's our business to know. Our business is to be faithful, to be faithful, to be faithful. Our business is to make ourselves useful, to be of service to others, to pass our blessings on. In my family, in my personal village, this is a given. I remember as a little girl, my mother used to always say to me, even when I was busy, even when I was doing my chores, my homework, what I was supposed to be doing, she said, Gloria, make yourself useful. Now, as a little kid, I'm irritated, okay? I'm going like, mm-mm-mm. Who does she think? But you can't say that in my house, okay? Not and get out of it. Alive. <laughs> okay? <laughs> But these days, you know, my 87-year-old mother is sitting right here on my shoulder. Make yourself useful is the voice of legacy to me today. It just rolls through me, rolls through me. I'd like to close this morning with a poem. 
It's one of my poems that I wrote many, many years ago. It's called Song to Myself. And this poem is all about what I've been sharing with you this morning about courage and gratitude and vision and perseverance and faithfulness. Now next Sunday is Father's Day. And so I'm going to dedicate this poem for Father's Day to my father and to Mr. Faulkner. It's a celebration and tribute to two ordinary men who did the extraordinary. They moved against the tide. They were faithful to themselves and to God. And they were faithful at a very turbulent time in our history. You know, kind of like the turbulence we're experiencing today. This was a time when it was unfashionable for whites to reach across a chasm and extend a hand to a black person. And it was almost unthinkable and unimaginable for a black man to dream big and to dream outside of the lines for a life that was far different than the one they were born into. My poem is called Song to Myself. It doesn't matter to me what you do or where you work. I want to know who you are when the sun goes down and if you are willing to put everything on the line to fulfill your soul's desire. It doesn't matter to me how much bread you can afford to put on your own table. I want to know if you will knead and wait and bake the bread and share your blessings at somebody else's table. I want to know if you can look into the eyes of the young woman who sleeps with fear each night, the one who dared to walk away from the hands that pummeled her. I want to know if you can share her pain. It doesn't matter to me what neighborhood you live in or what kind of car you drive. I want to know what drives you, what compels you, what pierces your heart, what awakens you at night and inspires you to devote yourself to whomever or whatever moves you. I want to know how many times you've opened your heart and extended a hand to your homeless sister or brother. I want to know if you will grasp the sleeve of a nameless elder stumbling on his way and lead him in from the cold. I want to know if you will sit in the quiet, dark hours between midnight and dawn, listening to another's heart song. I want to know if you will throw away your cloak and open your heart, if you will dare to wear your soul on the outside. It doesn't matter to me what you say you will do for others. I want to know if you will act with courage and conviction, if you will daily cradle the frail hand of your mother when she no longer knows your name. I want to know if you will look into the hazel, gray, or ebony eyes of a stranger and say, yes, yes, yes to affirm your sister, your brother, yourself. It doesn't matter to me that you have a past. I want to know if you will celebrate your present, if you will declare yourself and sing, I, I am. I am 
boldly and with rejoicing to anyone, anywhere, without apologies or regrets. I want to know. I want to thank you for the opportunity to talk to the faithful and for the opportunity to preach to the choir. Thank you so much. Thanks again, Pastor Terry. <laughs>